I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Kirby Barrett. Um, Kirby's going to talk to us about his work in Egypt, and uh, he'll tell you a little bit more about the things he's been doing. But it's uh, over multiple years' worth of time, and it's pretty interesting work. And so we asked him to come and share with us kind of what they did, how they did, it, and where they are. I'll turn it over to you. Okay. This is the this is the topic or the title that I chose. Would Dr. Roberts ask if I would do this and, and, and talk about the Egypt Project? But before I get into that, I I need to share some background about me. I am the luckiest guy in the world. When I was 18 years old, I went around the world. Okay. Some of you are familiar with FFA. It was through FFA. We left um, actually Dayton, Ohio with a plane load of young dairy animals, 66 head of dairy cattle, on what was then the largest Boeing plane that was made, a 707. That's you know just above a prop in these days. And flew via uh, New York. Um, at that point, it was still Idlewild. Gives you a hint about when this was, uh, Amsterdam and into Bombay as a part of a state FFA project through uh, Church World Service. Heifer Project, which is now Heifer International, that's all part of that. So we spent some time in India, and by the way, while I was in India, um, uh, India and Pakistan were at war. That really made my parents watch the national news every, every night. It really wasn't a big deal, but it, it was to them, obviously. And then we did Hong Kong, Japan, um, Hawaii on, on the way back home. I'd like to say it was because I was dang good. The truth is, luck. I was born the right year to be state FFA president the right year to go because nobody ahead of me or nobody after me has had that kind of an experience. Now, I, I learned a couple things from that. And, and one is, when we're in international development, because uh, Ohio State, which was my home institution at that point, Illinois, Kansas State, several major land-grant universities had invested a lot of money in building colleges of agriculture and extension or training and visitation systems in India, in Brazil, by the way, uh, in, in other places. So it was, it was interesting for me at such a young age to see the development that was going on because because people were leaving something behind. And I don't mean stuff, I mean uh, the, uh, wherewithal, in, intelligence, uh, the, the work in building those universities, and also leaving 66 head of dairy cattle behind. Now, we know that dairy cows are somewhat still sacred among Hindus. <clears throat> they were drinking water buffalo milk, and a water buffalo gives about three cups of milk a day, for heaven's sakes. Uh, but we're expanding their dairy and, and changing some of their notions, the, the Hindu nation. And of course, there's a fairly large population of, uh, of Indians that are not Hindu. They're Muslim, they're Sikhs, or, or, and, and others. Uh, so leaving that behind, <clears throat> now it was a good learning experience for this farm boy from Central Ohio, for heaven's sakes, but it also was something that I assume that generation after generation after generation, because we're talking now 48 years ago that we did that, um, the dairy industry has expanded to help feed not the 400,000 people in India back then, but the 1.2 million people who are in India now. Fast forward then to when I was on the faculty at Ohio State, <coughs> we had a project at the University of Swaziland. Uh, uh, Uniswa had just divorced from uh, the, the university that included Swaziland, uh, Lesotho, and Botswana, so that they each had their own institution. They were doing a lot of growing. The dean of the faculty of agriculture at the University of Swaziland was a PhD graduate from Ohio State. I knew him, uh, his wife also has a PhD in, he in, in uh, teacher ed, she in ag communication. And, and, and Barnabas Domini, so have not even gone to AIAEE, Dr. Domini taught me something as well. And that is, you don't need to come over here and tell us what we need and what we need to do. You need to come over here and help us figure out what we need to do and help us do what it is that we need to do. You know, we are so Western-centric. In fact, I have, I've shared this many, many times. You walk in almost any public school classroom in this country and there'll be a map of the world and North and South America will be right in the middle. 
which means you have to have Asia on this side <clears throat> and Asia on that side because you can't get all of Asia on either the left or the right. You go outside of the Western world and North America is over here and it goes all the way across and nobody has to be split. Well, Antarctica, but you know, whatever. The penguins don't seem to mind. But the notion is that we, we are raised, no, no, one, no one ever tells us in North American schools, we are the center of the globe. It's just that the map uh, very uh, uh, covertly sends that message and we think that we are in the center of everything. And once we start moving to other places, like with Dr. Dean Delmini at, at, at Uniswa, um, no, we, we, don't have, we, we don't have all the answers, but we can help others find out what the questions are and those answers to leave something behind when we were doing those field attachment workshops for the faculty the University of Swaziland and the Faculty of Agriculture. Well, um, the whole notion then of what I've tried to do since I had the opportunity to start working with these two USAID projects uh, and, and a third project in Egypt carries on that way. It's, it's international development. Now, I'm not putting down study abroad because I've led study abroad trips and they're wonderful to get kids out of the United States. You know, we always teased in Illinois those wealthy uh, young people from the Gold Coast, the, the uh, north suburbs of Chicago. Uh, they thought going to Wisconsin was an international experience and who would ever do that anyway because we have everything in Lake Forest and Glen Cove and those other really nice movie and all those places up there. And I thought, well, these wealthy kids, oh, they, they did have international experience. And I always told them on our freshman course, no, 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 no. Staying at the JW Marriott in Cancun is not an international experience, okay? Maybe the waiter speaks Spanish at home, but that really, that's not an international engagement. So, it, I mean, it is important to get kids, to get their big toe in the water. But then as we continue, it's, uh, my passion has been the whole notion of development, of helping whoever it is figure out what they ought to do, help them do what they ought, ought to do. Uh, e even my own sisters ask me, uh, well, they think I'm crazy, but that's, uh, that's another story. They've asked me, why, why do you go to Egypt so much? I've been to Egypt 20 times now. Well, I've shared even with the Egyptians. When I go back and nothing has happened, that's my last trip. That is my last trip because there are other things that I can do uh, rather than just try. I, I, I've seen the pyramids. They do not change from one year to another as I go. Okay, that sounds a little uppity, but you know, there's no need to go back and see the pyramids. Again, I've seen that. So as long as this is working, as long as we're leaving something behind that we can help them with, I will keep going to Egypt, assuming that there is USAID project or the Shura Foundation for Educational Development, which is what I'm working with now, and that there's a little bit of peace in uh, in downtown Cairo. Well, so here, here's, here's what I really want to talk about. For, first of all is this whole notion that agriculture is important in Egypt. You know, we, we think of Egypt as just a whole bunch of sand. Well, there's a lot of sand, but they've got this blue thing goes all the way through the country and about a mile on every side of that it is very, very rich from years and years and years of flooding and the very deep soils there. And of course, now they have contained the Nile River so it doesn't flood and all of that rich farmland, and part of it is also city land now, and up into the Delta in, in the Alexandria region, ag is very, very important. The other reason it's important is because there are 80 million people there, for heaven's sakes. Somebody's got somebody's to feed them. Now, we like for them to continue to buy our wheat. That is US-centric. But on the other hand, they can't buy all their food. Second is um, that Egyptian agriculture is highly productive. Uh, the last time we took students there, the, the cows ambassadors, we went to Mafa Farms. It's about an hour north of Cairo, right on the river, of course, duh. Uh, uh, 4,500 acres, 8,000 employees. Fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, and cut flowers. And almost all for the export market to go into the Middle East and into, uh, into Europe and into Western Russia, because that's where the money is. Just an aside, I also enjoy working in, in Egypt because I can look at any farmer in this state and say, I have not done anything to have a negative effect on what you do. 
because we don't export tomatoes to central, uh, uh, the, the Middle East or Europe or all these other things that they're doing. Unlike <laughs> our uh, great friends in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa that helped the Brazilians learn how to grow soybeans and now they eat our lunch with soybean production. We could probably also talk citrus fruit there too. Increased exports are vital to the rural economy. That's the only way that the rural economy is going to improve, that is bigger, greater production and then exporting. Yeah, they need the food for themselves, but those farmers also need to be able to produce enough for themselves and their family and their community, but then also to export because that's where they get the money that they can turn right around and reinvest it in what they're doing so that they can grow more and better crops for the export market. So they, And you see this is an upward spiral is, is what we're working on. Small scale uh, farm, I already talked about that. Agriculture then needs a well-prepared labor force because there are a lot of people um, uh, much like rural America a hundred years ago who were just trying to get off the farms because there wasn't much of a future there. We've seen that in, in, uh, in Egypt as well. So uh, these are the three things I'm, I'm going to, the, th the three things, the three projects. The first one, uh, the, well the first two are both funded by the U.S. Agency for International Development through the Midwest University Consortium for International Activities which uh, is based at Michigan State University. It's a consortium of the Midwest schools, about uh, eight of them I think. And their notion is that these projects are so big that typically one university cannot afford the resources that's called faculty time to work on. So you get faculty from here and faculty from there. And, and I was still at the University of Illinois when I got uh, into this project. So the first one is uh, Agricultural Exports uh, for Rural Income, AERI, and had, had three parts. Capacity building, which is what I worked on, and then public-private partnerships and the whole notion of biotechnology. Uh, and I'll come back and talk more about that. The second one then is the value chain training project. Uh, the first one is university level. This is high school level, the agricultural technical schools. And then the third one, the one that I'm working with now is actually f funded by the Shura Foundation for Development. Uh, Shura is uh, the largest chemical company in Egypt, one of the largest chemical companies in all, all, all of North Africa and in the Middle East. They have a lot of money. Um, they not only have a chemical company, but I've been to the restaurant that they own and you know, it's just one of those, a bit like MAFA owns more than just farms. At any rate, they have money and they are investing in, uh, in Egypt, in Egypt agriculture. It's self-serving, I mean, let's admit, it's self-serving because as farmers get more productive, then they need more uh, fertilizers, uh, pesticides, those sorts of things, and that's what Shura Foundation sells to them. So if it's a, you scratch my back, I'll, I scratch yours, not any different from what we do here. So then let's talk about this capacity building component. <clears throat> Um, Competency-based curricula was what, was what we were working on. New and updated courses in teaching and also this, this notion of internships. Now this is at the university level. Most of, we worked with five faculties of agriculture. The University of Cairo, uh, at Fayum, Minya Asut, and South Valley, which is the, the, the Kenna campus. It's about an hour from Luxor, so we're way south, uh, way down into, uh, into Upper Egypt. Working with the faculties of agriculture and also working with the ag technical schools. So that first project that we're working with universities, it's almost duplicated at the ag technical school system. Now, a little bit about the educational system. If you plan to go to school at a place like Cairo University, 250,000 students at Cairo University, when you apply, uh, maybe your first preference is medical school. And, and there, there's no four years of a bachelor's degree and then go to medical school, you go right to medical school. If you don't get into medical school, then maybe you'll get into engineering. And if you don't get into engineering, maybe you'll get into business. And if you don't get into business, then maybe you'll get into agriculture. So there are students in agriculture who were there because that's how they got into Cairo University. Many of those students get masters and PhDs in agriculture at Cairo University, and they and they stay there as faculty. So it's a very vertically integrated, and I'm not sure that that's a real positive thing. But I, you know, they don't even advertise when they have a faculty position at Cairo. They don't even advertise at Fayum to see if there's a PhD person there who might want to come to Cairo to teach. There's there's none of that at, at all. So we're working with faculty who uh, maybe didn't want to teach to begin with, uh, but they are. 
And then for the ag technical schools, there is nothing between the university and the ag technical schools. They have general high schools and they have ag tech, they have technical schools in agriculture, in commercial or business, and in uh, uh, technical training, you know, automotive, those sorts of things. Uh, going to, a, to a, the general high schools uh, you, it prepares you to go to college. Going to a technical school prepares you, well, we're not sure yet. Okay, there is no community college. There's no 13th and 14th grade. Uh, uh, there's there's no Santa Fe that that that, that they have any place. So it, it's a dead end street for some of those students unless they have the kinds of skills that'll help them get a good job and advance in a career. And th and that's that's what we were talking about, both for the university setting and for the high school setting. Now these are all the people who make this thing work. Okay, first of all, it's USAID, it's their money, it's, it's, it's the American people, through MUSEA, the Egyptian University of Faculty Administrators, ATS instructors, and their headmasters. We have always brought the headmasters along because the schools are also very hierarchical. If the headmaster says yes, it happens. If the headmaster doesn't say yes, it probably is not going to happen there. Uh, external advisor committees, which we started, we had steering committees for the project. We have been working both the university faculties and the high school high schools to have external advisory councils. They'd never had those before. And, and we were joking earlier, the whole notion of community is not a word that translates into Arabic and the Egyptian culture. Because we talk about the school community. Uh, Dr. Roberts, uh, his children go to Santa Fe schools in the Alachua district, but it's the Santa Fe community, you know, that rallies around that school. They're very supportive. There's no such thing uh, as, as that in, in Egypt. So to get these outside people to come in and, and help with the schools and then get to the, the school people to accept what they're saying, that's, that's been a major coup itself. Uh, obviously U.S. faculty, I'll come back to that much, much later, Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Education because that's where the money is, the Shura Foundation and then Egyptian Business and Industry have been very supportive in, in helping with the projects and in providing materials and those sorts of things. So I'm going to show you a model that we developed uh, as we were working there and it has three components, assessment, content, and process. So there's a, there it is and going from left to right then, the, the, the first, the whole assessment is that there are industry needs and there are students student competency levels when they graduate from the ag technical schools and when you put those together uh, you can do a school a skill gap analysis and sure enough there was a skill gap and this is true for both the universities and also for the ag technical schools well then the content is we need to use advisor committees I already beat that to death uh, we, we Im implemented internships in fact the first trip that that uh, I asked dr. Roberts to go with me we were talking about supervised experience programs because that's U.S. language, they like internships. It's the same stuff that we that we worked with them on, but it was the whole notion of getting the students to have some practical, hands-on experience instead of just the book learning. And book learning there isn't that strong because they don't have any books. In one of the high schools, I saw an agribusiness textbook. It was a six by nine paperback. 60 pages. That was for the entire year. Now we think we have challenges of teaching. Can you imagine teaching high school kids? No wonder they have a 50%, 50% attendance rate. Why would you go? There's nothing going on. At any rate, uh, teaching decision making skills, leadership skills, uh, although we don't use that word, uh, at, at least under the Mubarak regime, it was quite clear that they don't need people to develop leadership skills. Egypt has a leader, thank you very much. Doesn't need any more. <laughs> okay? Now that's kind of... Uh, far out, but that's what we were told. And then obviously the ag technical skills all coming together to build curricula for the universities, for those five faculties of agriculture, as well as, uh, well, we're working with about 50 ag technical schools in Upper Egypt. There are 180 or something in the, in the, whole, uh, in the whole republic. And then the process of developing the internships, developing ag technical content, bringing it up to date with the, with the support of industry, uh, active learning strategy, so we're, we get into the teaching and learning function, uh, they have embraced that. We've got some good reports from that. And then the leadership uh, competition events, all the faculty development, hopefully then that, that goes to all levels of agricultural workforce in Egypt and making some progress on what it is that, uh, that they need to do. So the, the whole assessment bit, industry needs, very, very important. Graduate preparedness, because 
they had a feeling that the graduates really didn't have much skill. They may have some knowledge, but not skill, and that to do that analysis. The content that I've, uh, I've already outlined uh, uh, for you, uh, it's, it's been transformational. Now again, it, it took some top down at the universities and also in the ag technical schools when, when, the, when the top person, man or woman, um, the, the dean of the faculty of agriculture when we started was, was, was a, a woman, which you don't see a lot of in, in, that, uh, in that system. If, if they say this is good stuff, then it's good stuff and everybody does get in line and they do the work. Now, actually, Amy, that's kind of foreign to me because just because someone higher than me says that this is really, really important doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to jump on that bandwagon. You know what I mean? No, you don't, but you will when you get as old as I am. The bandwagons have gone past me so many times. Uh, well, you, you know that I'm kidding. But, but it's just kind of interesting, this very strong hierarchy, but we learn to work within that because we're not going to change that. Um, I've teased many, many times <clears throat> The organization within the Ministry of Education that controls higher education is the Supreme Council on Higher Education. I would like to chair a Supreme Council someday. I mean, does that smack of power base? And it is. We even dealt with, when, when Grady and I, uh, uh, Dr. Myers has, has, has gone, uh, has worked with me, Dr. Thorne has worked with me, Dr. Washburn, who used to be here, has worked with me, uh, uh, Dr. Jamie Conn at Ohio State, uh, Ben Swan at Cal Poly, um, Chris Morgan at Georgia has, has been there. At, at any rate, as, as we work on all of these um, curricular activities and, and all of those kinds of things, we have to keep in mind that we get them to work within their system. And where I'm headed on this is the Supreme Council on Higher Education dictates the final exam for every course in the country. It must be 60% on the classroom technical content in an exam, final grade. So we just suggested with them that the law doesn't say that the final exam has to be in one sitting and that the final exam, maybe it's also in the laboratory that they're taking part of that final exam. So they're still doing 60% of the final grade is the final exam, but we work within that system because we're not there to tell them, hey, the US system works. Just look at how, we well, how well we do here. It served us well, but whatever. Now, faculty development, uh, working with these active learning strategies. We've done some follow-up work uh, with faculty on how they're uh, adapting and adopting those strategies. It's, it's really kind of fun. Uh, watching the ag technical content, I'll, I'll talk uh, some more about some success stories. The internship, the leadership competition. There is even a Future Farmers of Egypt organization. FFE. They're smarter than we are. Where our kids still wear those corduroy jackets, even in Florida when it's 95 degrees, they have lightweight cotton shirts. That's their jacket. I go, that's pretty smart in Egypt. I don't think you can even buy corduroy anything in Egypt. I mean, what on earth for? So dang hot. Okay. So programs then to, uh, to address the needs. <clears throat> Uh, we, we've already talked about, uh, uh, shared most of these. Uh, the teaching, well, we had both curriculum development and teaching enhancement workshops. The very first workshop that I was there, uh, Dr. Kano was, was with me. Uh, it's four days for faculty from all, well, four of those five universities. The first day I was teaching course syllabus, course, course construction, course development, and having a well-written course syllabus. That's great. The next morning, I'm not making this up, they bring to me what they had been working on since three o'clock the day before when we adjourned. Is, is, this, is this what you were talking about? About fainted. I would never do that. You know, we go to three-day workshops. Does anybody ever go back to your room and work all night in, in actually applying the stuff that they taught you? That's what got me hooked from the very beginning. These folks are using this. this. That's why I keep going back. And then we've used a train-the-trainer concept in that 
uh, this first wave of faculty and also ATS instructors that were in our workshops. We work very closely with them. We give them all the materials. Uh, they help with our translation so that they're learning the material uh, a, a second or a third time, depending on whichever, so they can go back and work with their colleagues within their, with their, uh, within their high schools because uh, we come back home. We, we, have, uh, we have jobs here, so we have to leave behind that wherewithal that they can keep working. I've talked about the experience learning, the internship development. Uh, we have done st uh, study tours. They have come here. Uh, we've had the Egyptians uh, on this campus. We had the Egyptians on the Illinois campus uh, uh, so that they can kind of see what we're doing and what we're talking about, and then this notion of student development activities. I was talking with uh, Dr. Spindler at Virginia Tech just a couple hours ago on another project he has me roped into, and I do mean that roped into, but anyway, this notion that the future farmers of Egypt uh, is, is, is not like, oh, we're from the national FFA in the United States, here's what you all need to do. That was never brought up. We talked about leadership development, not using the L word, and all of those sorts of things. It was born out of competitive events for these kids who are in internships. Now, some of you know the history of FFA, and it's, it's the roots, really, the, the roots are the National Vocational Agriculture Judging Contests that were held prior to 1928. So it's really kind of funny that we all start the same way, but it started out of their need, not because we said that, that uh, that they ought to have it. Well, I wanted to share some success stories. Again, it's what's been left behind and, and what development-wise is happening. First of all, skill analysis was done. More than 200 university courses have been revised and updated. We, I mean, we have the, the material, the Cairo office does. 100 university faculty in these active learning strategies workshops working with us. That we've had external advisory councils established at all five of those universities and at 50 AT uh, uh, ag tech schools, probably more than that by now. That we have a career and internship center, kind of like the one we've got over here in the Rights Union at the five universities for the students in the faculty faculties of agriculture. Uh, equipment and materials updated. I talked about the overhead projectors, some lab equipment and some other materials that the project has funded. More than 1,400 ag technical school teachers have now been trained. That's USAID wordy. I think you train dogs and you educate people, but that's beside the point. Uh, I've been trained in active learning strategies through this train the trainer, because uh, you know our, our group, our US faculty, uh, we've probably only met uh, 150 of those folks. And it's, you know, they go out and they keep going. 2,200 students in, in uh, ag internships, 3,400 students in ca these career development competitions. Uh, so that's working well. I already talked about the FFE being established. Enrollment in the COSAM ATS, which is um, just outside Luxor, doubled from 2007 to 2011. Now, is that cause and effect? I, I can't prove that, but we do know, by the way, that one of the ag teachers at, at COSAM has been doing the train the trainer uh, work as well, that there are good things going on there, and students see that being in that program, those kids go out and get internships, and then they get jobs there, and then they have money, and money is a really nice thing for the 16, 17, 18 year old set to have. They're no different from ours. ATS female students, there's a reason I put that there, rescued the Luxor export grape harvest, having difficulties with labor in the, in the export grape business. Now, their grapes are all grown on wires, and so when you are trimming grapes, you are in this position all the time. Just try that for a while. I painted my porch ceiling a couple weeks ago. <sighs> I either need to do that more or never, one or the other. But at any rate, the reason the girls is because they are more particular. Because we're talking about snipping out grapes from grape bunches uh, because these are being exported as fresh grapes. 
um, and, and they're in clamshells. Uh, you know, so they have to be beautiful because they get a lot of money for that. And the girls do a much better job of being particular of clipping out the grapes that need to come out of that bunch so that they will grow evenly and there won't be any gushy looking ones or whatever. I'm now way beyond my ability when it comes to grape pruning, but I know that they do good work and their hands are like this all the time. Uh, students uh, near, near Kenna started their own beekeeping business. So not only are they doing a job placement, but then they're starting their own businesses. Uh, I even, when we were at um, uh, Kamambo, we saw these the five girls started their own business of making dish uh, dishwashing uh, detergent. What, you know, when you're washing your hand, washing your dishes by hand, it's not good in the dishwasher because they don't have those things. But uh, making uh, making dishwasher soap, dishwashing soap. What a cool idea! And they make all kinds of money. Uh, the Kamambo students are uh, becoming vet assistants. I mean, as, as high school kids. Tomato Model Farm established a Dendera uh, Ag Technical School, which is uh, also up the road from, from, uh, from Kenna. Well, some summary things, you know. Improved curriculum and teaching. Internship programs. Train the trainer positive connections between ag business and industry and, and, the, and the public school system and the, and the universities. Uh, opportunities to expand this kind of work into other Northern African nations and, and also into the, into the Middle East. In fact, as, as uh, we were working on this, at one point we were ready to go to Lebanon and Syria. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to Syria for a while, okay, or even Lebanon. I might go to Algeria. That would work. Well, right now I'm going to Ghana. That's a very different project, but it's a long way from Egypt. At any rate, unwritten benefit, this is the one that I like, okay? An opportunity for faculty to be involved in international development. We can talk as universities that we all, we all need to be involved in international work. Well, to be real practical about it, to actually spend two or three years as a PI on a project that is internationally focused and spending uh, quite a bit of time out of the country, that probably is not a very good thing in the promotion and tenure system that we have in higher education. Now, you're doing good work, so you know, let's, let's say you're here for two or three years, and then you go off for two or three years, there's no publication that comes out of that until after you come back, and all of a sudden, even our new seven-year rule on IFAS, it's over, you know, <laughs> move on. But what I wanted to do was to get these young folks, Dr. Roberts was one of the first uh, that went, uh, Fon, Maj, all those names, because I, c I can afford it, okay? I'm a full professor. I don't have to do anything. <laughs> Y'all will show up to work, teach the class. That's about it. But to, but to support other, other faculty, and they're all young to me, for heaven's sakes, uh, even Grady, uh, uh, to, to support them so that then as they move up the food chain in the hierarchy of higher education, they can start developing these sorts of things. And by golly, that happens, doesn't it, Dr. Roberts? Yeah. He happens to be more of a Caribbean, Central American kind of guy. It's still international work and, and opportunities to really helping people change their own lives rather than for us to get them to choose the American way of doing things and doing stuff the way we do it because it works for us. Well, not every country has all the natural resources that we do. Not every country has uh, every, all those facilities that, w that we have, but we can help them figure out what they need and what they want and how they can make changes in their own lives and their own economy and their own educational system to make a difference. Thank you. Funded by USAID. The program is sponsored by the U.S. Agency for International Development are made possible through the generosity of American people. Contents of this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views of USAID or the United States government, even if it is shut down. <laughs> I still cannot talk to the government. Thanks, thanks for coming. Uh, questions or, or uh, whatever, we, whatever we want to do, Dr. Roberts. Yes, sir. What? Uh, my name is Jeremy. And, uh, So I'm really curious what resources were available for you to, to even embark on something like this. 
the USAID just say, hey, we're going to take care of everything from the point that you get on the plane until you land in Egypt, and then you'll be under our purview? Or was there some third-party entity or nonprofit or were the universities prepared to handle having American faculty working with them? Well, that's something that Okay. Um, well, there's some particulars uh, of, of the, the uh, uh, projects with the USAID projects that also then flow into the Sure Foundation project. Mm -hmm. Let me explain. Uh, I was at the University of Illinois, okay? Uh, Associate Dean for Academic Programs. Uh, Bert Swanson, who I've known for a long, long time. Actually, uh, Dr. Swanson's background is ag education, but it has all been in international rural development. Uh, a lot of ag education people across the country don't even know him. Now, I, I knew him because I'm, you know, a little older. I knew that he had an ag background, but I also knew that he did a lot of international work. The University of Illinois is a part of the Musea Consortium. Dr. Swanson has done all of this international development work. This RFP came along out of USAID for the, for the work in Egypt, and he decided that Illinois ought to be the lead institution on that. As he was putting the, propo <laughs> as he was putting the proposal together, Dr. Swanson, knowing that my background is ag education, even though at that point I was associate dean, he wandered in my office. And he was telling me about this project and have these three parts and there's this teaching and learning component and, and course development and improving teaching. Would I know of anybody in ag education who might be interested in this project? And I kind of go, this guy. me? <laughs> Now he knew that my background was teaching and learning, but he didn't know that I had an interest and a passion for international development work because I was at Ohio State when I did the Swazi stuff. And then, you know, when you become, uh, as they say, an assistant professor, little kids, I mean, we, we've all, I mean, they aren't excuses, they're reasons why you just can't do that sort of thing. So I hadn't done that sort of thing from 92 until 96. Well, this would have been in 90, well, 2004, for heaven's sakes. Um, so that's how I got So it was an RFP. Now, the other part that makes this work, the chief of party in Cairo is Dr. Mohamed Simi. Dr. Mohamed Simi has a PhD from the University of Illinois and worked <laughs> with Dr. Swanson. So there is that connection in, in actually writing the, the uh, proposal. And then when, uh, when Illinois, the lead institution, got it, Dr. Sammy went back to Cairo. And so he really led the effort in Cairo. And, and we've worked with, uh, with Sammy many, many times. Well, those two projects are now gone. The, the first one was about, uh, about 5.4 million. The second one was a little over 7 million. Those, they're done. They've finished. Dr. Sammy now works for Sure Foundation for Educational Development. Uh, because the, uh, the, the president, the CEO of Shura, was on our steering committee for those, for those initial projects. So they've known each other for a, a long time. Dr. El Shetty has been very, very supportive of the projects. And when uh, Sammy needed to move to something else, he hired Dr. Sammy for that project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, well, um, he wanted he wanted a job. <laughs> sure. Okay. He, he doesn't. Uh, uh, Doctor Sammy, when he when he retires, will actually live in Chicago. <laughs> he he, uh, he owns he owns a home in Chicago. Uh, his wife lives in Chicago now with one of their sons. Both both of their sons are actually uh, citizens of the United States. They were born while less. Uh, 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 mm -hmm. so yes. Yes. And, and so very good at it because he's an Egyptian. Yes, and, and, and it's not just speaking the language, it's also speaking the language, it's talking to the Arabs, you know, because they have a very different way of doing business than we do. Um, and I mean, that was so helpful than as some Midwestern white guy over there and trying to work with, uh, within the Arab culture would not have been nearly as easy. 
So it, it's much like I said, I was, I was lucky at 18 to go around the world to spend all that time in India and Hong Kong. Uh, we were lucky that Dr. Sammy was at Illinois, good friends, good colleagues with Dr. Swanson when that project was put together. Yeah. And that, by the way, is a continuation which has nothing to do with the topic that Dr. Roberts asked me to talk about today, and that is with the Modernize and Extension Advisory Services Project, NICE, also USAID, funded through Illinois. Uh, Dr. Swanson was the lead investigator to begin with. Dr. Paul McNamara is now. Paul was on the Ag Econ faculty when I was there. And the program manager, uh, uh, Andrea Bone, I hired Andrea as my assistant dean for study abroad programs when she and her husband were deciding to move from Hohenheim, uh, Germany to the University of Illinois. So I now work with Andrea in a very different capacity and it's an extension instead of in public school. <laughs> but teaching and learning is teaching and learning and program development is program development. Yeah. And I hope that in those projects, like the, the reference to Ghana that I made, I hope in those projects we're leaving something behind as well. Because I mean, honestly, it, if, if it doesn't matter to them, then it doesn't matter to me. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go to Pennsylvania and see my grandchildren instead. <laughs> you know? Who would like to be faculty members, but no such thing as ed exists. Mm -hmm. It'll be an international development specialist. Mm -hmm. How do those students best position themselves for obtaining faculty positions where they can follow that passion but still be influenced? Mm -hmm. And we're recording this, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yep. They have to have wherewithal in something that is central to the mission. So they need to be teacher educators, or they need to be extension specialists with an interest in. Dr. Swanson is a teacher educator, public school, ag education, with an interest in international, and over time, I mean, Bert's 75 years old or whatever, so it's been a while. Over time, that opportunity came for him to use that expertise in an international setting. Um, I'll just be real blunt about it. The project that uh, Virginia Tech right now is dealing with, the corpus of the people at the main top of that activity have no background at all in public school agriculture. And that project is nothing but public school agriculture in developing nations. That's crazy. That's crazy. Now, they're now bringing it along. In fact, I'm doing a video next week for that project about public school agricultural education. But it's, to me, it's just goofy that these folks who are broad-based international thinking kinds of folks also think that they know everything about anything that comes along whether it's public school ag education or extension in Feed the Future Countries or whatever those things are, you gotta, you, gotta have a, you gotta have a background in something that is central to the mission. And for us, it's ag comm, it's ag leadership, it's ag extension, it's ag teaching. One of those four, and then we apply those. Uh, I've, I've dealt with several Walter Bowens, you know, international uh, ag people. They're all delightful people. Uh, they're uh, actually Walter's predecessor's predecessor. You know, his predecessor was Dr. Sammons. His predecessor then could never quite understand why we didn't talk about a four-legged stool in the land-grant university. Teaching, research, and extension international. I go because it is, I, I don't mean to infer silos, teaching, research, extension, and international. Across all of those, we ought to be doing international work in teaching and in research and in extension, not, well, you're doing teaching and you're doing international. Do international what? Teaching, research, or extension, or a combination of all of those. So we've, we've kind of promoted that weirdo thinking, I think, as we have a, a director or some places have a dean for uh, for international within the College of Ag or the IFAS or whatever, but it's got it's got to cut this way. 
as dean, I was the only one of the three deans in IFAS, as dean, I supported from academic funds the International Program Office for international academic venues. And I thought the other two deans ought to as well for two reasons. One, they should. Secondly, they had more money than I did, for heaven's sakes. But, I mean, I, that's how important I thought that was, that we have an opportunity to support international academic programs venues, just like we were supporting UF academic program venues in, in agriculture. So we, we, we got to have we got to have centrality to what we're doing. And then we apply that in different ways. NGOs, business and industry, higher education. I also see that with NGO people. Some people are NGO people because they want to be NGO people. Other people are teachers, curriculum development people, agronomists, or whatever, who've chosen to apply those skills to an NGO. Those are two very, very different to me. Those are very different. And it's the latter group that I think is more successful. Anything else? Thank you, Kurt. Okay, sure enough, thank you.